Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Sloan, and I'm a park interpreter here with Manitoba Parks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight to learn all about cross-country skiing this winter. I've just put up a poll here to answer as we begin. Uh, if you haven't yet, please answer what region do you cross-country ski most frequently in Manitoba? Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and a recording will be posted to our Manitoba Parks YouTube channel later tomorrow. All participants are in listen-only mode with cameras and microphones off. If you have any questions over the course of the webinar here this evening, please type them in the question window, and we will strive to answer as many as we can here this evening. I'd like to first acknowledge that Manitoba's provincial parks are on the treaty territories and ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene, and the homeland of the Red River Métis. We acknowledge Northern Manitoba includes lands that were and are the ancestral lands of the Inuit. Manitoba Parks respects the spirit and intent of treaties and treaty making and remain committed to working in partnership with First Nations, Inuit and Métis people in the spirit of truth, reconciliation and collaboration. When out cross-country skiing in Manitoba this winter, I encourage you to learn more about the peoples and the traditional lands that you are visiting. Tonight, I'm very pleased to be joined by Ken Shikulski, He's an instructor with the Canadian Association of Nordic Ski Instructors. We've been really fortunate to have Ken with us over uh, a number of winters here now, uh, running a few ski clinics in uh, Birds Hill, Spruce Woods, and White Shell. And uh, during the pandemic here, we shifted to a bit of a hybrid model with a webinar and uh, continuing through that here uh, this year. Uh, since it's been so popular and happy to see uh, over 50 people are, are joined us here this evening. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it off right to Ken. Uh, welcome, Ken, and thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, the microphone is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Sloan. And um, yeah, thank, welcome to everybody tonight. I'm uh, really pleased to be here and to be able to spend some time talking with you about my favorite topic, cross-country skiing and to help you prepare for the ski season, or uh, we're, we're quite into the ski season. We have a nice early start this year. So I'll help you uh, continue uh, to have a really enjoyable ski season. And for those of you that have signed up for the clinics and parks, this is going to be a little bit of a, a preparation for your upcoming clinics. I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. So Sloan, you'll have to... Uh, uh, give me the screen sharing, I think. Okay, I think we can do this now. Should be able to share there now. There we go. Okay. So we're just going to. Okay. Good. So over the next uh, 25 minutes, I'll be sharing with you some uh, some ideas and some information on the best ways to dress for cross-country skiing, uh, some ideas on selecting equipment if you're in the market for buying equipment, some ideas on how to uh, get the equipment that's best suited for you. We'll talk about waxing skis uh, a little bit, and then we'll finish up with... Uh, uh, some other ideas on getting ready for the upcoming clinics and, and getting you ready for uh, for cross country skiing this winter, and we'll have time at the end for uh, for some questions. So let's get started here. When we talk about clothing for cross country skiing, uh, the first thing I like to uh, to mention to people is to um, uh, if you're new to skiing, don't feel that you have to go out and buy an entire new wardrobe for cross country skiing. You're almost certainly going to have clothes that will work just fine for cross-country skiing, and over time you'll you'll pick up uh, you know a new jacket or a new new layer of some sort and build up that uh, that choice wardrobe for skiing over over time. Uh, and you probably have you know stuff that's suitable right now for getting out and enjoying the trails. The most important aspect about uh, dressing for cross-country skiing is to dress in layers. Layers that you can adjust 
uh, are removed to help you stay warm, yet avoid overheating and getting wet. Getting wet is one of the, the, the big dangers in being outdoors in the winter time. You want to stay dry as much as possible. And these layers also have to allow you to move, move nicely, give you lots of freedom of movement because skiing is a very dynamic activity and you need to be able to, uh, to move nicely. So when we're uh, dressing for skiing, the best way to approach this is to start off with a base layer. So this is the layer that's next to your skin. And this is best as a polypropylene or synthetic layer or light wool, something like a merino wool works really well. Uh, really avoid cotton for your base layer because cotton will get wet and stay wet and you'll get chilled when you're out skiing. Uh, on top of that, you'll want to uh, wear one or two mid layers, an insulating layer. Uh, this is usually a, a light fleece or mid-weight fleece that works really well and just keeps you keeps you warm and is yet yeah, something that you could take off if you're getting a little bit too hot underneath. And then importantly, your, your outer layer is going to be a uh, snow resistant, wind resistant uh, jacket of some sort, uh, something that's going to be uh, ideally breathable as well. So those are kind of the three key layers that you want when you're when you're skiing. In terms of your legs, the bottoms, you'll probably just go with the base layer and the outer layer. And you can adjust that depending whether you kind of run hot or run cold as you're doing activities outside. I really like to emphasize in terms of clothing, the importance of some of these little extras in your wardrobe, you know, a, a toque the right kind of toque for, for the day. So if it's a cold day, a nice thick toque. If it's a warmer day, just uh, you know something quite, quite light will help you stay a little bit cooler as you're out exercise. Gloves or mitts, really important part of your skiing outfit. Uh, I like to use uh, mitts in most, uh, most all weather conditions with a, a nylon shell and a fleece or wool liner. So I can pull the liner out and stick them in the box a little bit too warm. Some of my favorite clothing items for cross-country skiing are actually a neck warmer or a buff and uh, in colder weather uh, maybe even earmuffs. The neck warmer or buff is great because it keeps your neck warm and yet if you get too hot it's just super easy to pull it off and stick it in a pocket and be cool and away you go again enjoying, enjoying the trails. Uh, with, uh, with mitts uh, or gloves uh, it's important to make sure that uh, you know, whatever you're wearing is going to be such that you can hold your poles. You need to have some dexterity there for holding your poles and, and moving, moving nicely with your poles. So those are some of the key elements of clothing that I really like to mention to people as they're getting ready for the ski season. Let's move on to equipment. Now, as I'm talking about equipment, I'm talking about equipment for classic skiing. Uh, skate skiing, the other uh, other form of cross country skiing, has an entirely different set of equipment. Boots, bindings, pole skis are all different. So we're going to focus on classic skiing, and that's what the uh, the workshops in the provincial parks this winter are going to be focusing on. Your boots. Your boots are the most important part of your ski equipment. They have to be comfortable, not too large, so your foot flops around and you'll get sore spots nor too small where you'll end up with cold feet. Uh, find boots that are, are just the right size for you, fitting like a, a regular shoe would fit. Uh, if you happen to uh, use, use an orthotic, make sure that you can get your orthotic in the ski boot and wear the orthotic, orthotic in your ski boot. It's more important in, in skiing than perhaps even in walking. And if you're, uh, if you're out uh, shopping for new equipment or you need to upgrade part of your equipment, it's important these days to recognize that boots and bindings are not interchangeable anymore. The industry has gone through cycles where they are interchangeable and then they get into proprietary equipment and then interchangeable again. So we're into the uh, proprietary equipment phase of the cycle right now. So if you, uh, if you end up uh, having to, for instance, get new boots, but you want to keep your older skis, well, you might end up having to change the bindings on the skis because your boots may not fit the older bindings. And bindings are easy to change. Most are attached to the skis by about five screws, uh, and any ski shop will be able to do that for you, for you quite easily. If you are getting new bindings uh, or you know, switching equipment, uh, 
make sure that you know how the binding works. There's uh, many different types on the market now, and uh, they all have kind of little different uh, different twists to them as to uh, as to how you get your your boot in and how you release your boot from the binding. Let's look at poles. Now, poles are actually part of your uh, your equipment that you're using to propel yourself down the trail. They're not for balancing. So it's important that you get poles that are going to work effectively for you. Your poles should come up to about the midpoint on your shoulder or maybe close to the top of your shoulder, which typically is about 0.83 of your body height. Um, with the poles on the market these days, there's a wide, kind of a wide variety of uh, straps you can get. There's a simple loop strap, easy to use. Uh, and then you can also get a little bit more complicated strap, sometimes called a power strap, which fits a little bit more like a glove and has a Velcro closure. Um, both work uh, very well. The power straps are uh, certainly a little bit more effective in cross country skiing, but both work well. Uh, if you're uh, shopping for this, uh, for poles, you know, recognize that the uh, power straps are usually designed to be worn with gloves. So if you typically wear bigger mitts, uh, the straps may not fit. And um, uh, the, the power straps can be a little bit of a hassle to take on and off. If you're uh, stopping along the trail to uh, have a drink of water, you might end up having your pole flopping around as you're trying to uh, trying to hold your uh, your water bottle. So a couple of considerations to, to bear in mind as you're thinking about poles and selecting poles to uh, fill out your ski equipment. Now let's take a look at the skis. This is the important part of the whole package. It's super, super important to make sure that your skis are the right length and right stiffness for your body, body weight and for your height. Skis have a camber to them. So that's this curve along the length of the ski. And we need to be able to uh, push the ski down as we're skiing to get the ski flattened down onto the snow. So it grips the snow and allows us to push ourselves forward. And then as we get our weight off the ski, the ski can glide. And that's critical in terms of the stiffness of the ski. Uh, a good ski shop will measure the stiffness of the ski for you and make sure it's matched up to your body weight. Uh, the ski manufacturers actually put that as a, a label on the ski, but it can be a little bit difficult to decipher the coding on it. But, uh, a good ski shop will do that for you. A good rule of thumb, is to uh, have your ski come up to your bent wrist when your arm is up above your head. Uh, that's uh, for a long, long time has been kind of a, a standard measuring method and it, it still works, but it's always best to have the camber of the ski tested with the equipment that you might find in a ski shop. Uh, there are different types of skis on the market if you're uh, looking for, for new skis. The, uh, the new one that's uh, taking the market by storm these days is the skin ski. Now, the skin ski has a uh, strip of mohair type fabric underfoot, and this provides the grip for the uh, ski, so you don't have to do any grip waxing with the ski. But because that strip of mohair is not adjustable, it's really, really important with skin skis that they be um, selected to uh, to match your weight. So the stiffness of the ski has to match your weight to uh, to work effectively and give you a good ex good skiing experience. Uh, skin skis work well in all conditions, um, and especially in warmer weather or changeable weather. And um, uh, the uh, the skins wear out in time over the course of uh, many years, but they can be replaced at a reasonable price. So the, uh, the skis do have longevity to them. Uh, also, you can still find uh, waxless skis. Now, these are skis that have kind of a pattern of fish scale type grooves in the bottom that allow you to grip the snow and push yourself forward. Like the skin ski, that pattern of grooves is not adjustable, so it's important that with waxless skis, they be the right stiffness for your body weight. Uh, these skis uh, 
again, work well in most conditions, uh, particularly in, uh, in warm and variable weather. Um, and, uh, I think they're quite common in coastal areas where you get a lot of wet snow as well, and they tend to, to work in those conditions. And then uh, the traditional ski in the middle here is a waxable ski. And this one's got a, a layer of wax in the middle. Um, they, uh, they also need to be the, the proper stiffness, proper camber for your body weight. But because you can adjust the area on the bottom that you're waxing, you do have a little bit more uh, flexibility in terms of, of that with, uh, the waxable ski. They perform well in all, ski, in all weather conditions, in all snow conditions, as long as they're waxed properly. And waxing is not a difficult task at all. Uh, a lot of people find it a, a really onerous uh, undertaking, but it's quite simple. Sometimes a little bit challenging right around zero, but uh, still pretty simple, uh, simple effort to get into uh, or enjoying your skiing. And we're going to move into wax and talking about just what type of wax we put on for our skiing. There are two types of waxes that go on to ski, skis. First, there's the glide wax. And the glide wax is applied just to the, the front of the ski, tip of the ski, and to the very back of the ski. And that's the part of the ski that we actually glide on. The center part of the ski is where we get our grip. Um, the wax is usually melted onto the ski and then iron smooth and then scrape to a nice, nice smooth polish. Uh, this isn't a particularly difficult or complicated process. Uh, it can get a little bit messy in terms of scraping the wax, and it's best done if you have specialized equipment like a waxing iron. Uh, except for races that will change their glide wax potentially for every race because the snow conditions are, are different and, and glide waxes vary depending on their temperatures and the like. Um, but racers will change their, their glide waxes very often. For the average recreational skier, once a year will certainly be, be adequate. Uh, typically I'm on skis uh, maybe about five days a week throughout the winter and uh, I have my skis waxed just once a year. A good idea is to, uh, if you're not into waxing, uh, glide waxing skis yourself, uh, take them to a ski shop at the end of the season and get them uh, glide waxed. The ski shops aren't as busy then and they'll be ready to go next year. If you wait until the fall, until the snow falls, uh, you might have to wait a little while to get your, your skis waxed. If you find that your skis have uh, white or gray spots showing up right at the tip or right at the tail of the ski, that's usually an indication that the glide wax is worn off. And then you'll have to uh, get them uh, get them glide waxed again. So most, most ski shops will do this. Uh, the Nordic Center in Winnipeg will also do that. And uh, it's an uh, easy thing to get your skis ready for the season that way. Let's take a look at grip waxes now. Now the grip waxes go into the wax pocket, what we call the wax pocket. And this is the center of the ski. Uh, typically it goes from the, the pin of the binding, sort of just, just beside your toes to the heel, and then that same distance forward. And this is the portion of the ski that when you put your weight onto the ski, it gets flattened down onto the snow, allows you to get some grip and push yourself forward. Over on the right-hand side, you can see that the wax pocket on my ski with this, this uh, whitish film on it, which is the grip wax, just exists in the middle of the ski. So that's our wax pocket, and that's an important uh, area to have sort of delineated on, on your ski for applying the grip wax. There's a whole range of different grip waxes out there. But my approach to waxing is to keep it simple. Um, for the, uh, the average Manitoban recreational skier, four or five waxes will probably get you through the winter without any real difficulty. Uh, even though there is, there's a whole range hanging out in the background, you can get, uh, get by with four or five. Waxes uh, 
have different temperature ranges associated with them and that temperature is marked right on the tube. So this one is a minus four to minus 10 wax. And uh, they go uh, in sort of a, a, a decreasing temperature range. So very cold waxes uh, for minus 15 and colder, they've got a big wide range in which they work. And then as you get warmer, that temperature range narrows down to like six degrees here and maybe about four or five degrees for a blue wax. And then as you get close to zero, the temperature may, range may be as little as one degree. But you'll find over time you, you've got, uh, you know, your favorite waxes, the ones that you find work for you well. And uh, chances are you'll end up with about four or five and that's gonna be enough for, for your skiing enjoyment. And these waxes last a long time. You'll get years of service out of one tube of wax. Applying the wax is super easy. I'll tell you a secret. I never spend more than a minute waxing my ski. I want to get out and enjoy my skiing. So we know where that wax pocket is on our ski. You just take the wax for the day, the appropriate temperature. You rub it on just like you were using a crayon. You take the cork that comes in your wax kit back and forth a few times just to polish that wax up and you're set to go. Go skiing, have a great time. And then when you come back, you've got a metal or plastic scraper in your wax kit. You just scrape the wax off your ski, get it back down to the base. And you do that because the wax gets dirty uh, as you're out skiing, uh, sometimes really dirty, in, especially in the springtime. And if, uh, if you forget what wax uh, is on your ski, the next time you go to ski, you're gonna have to strip that wax off anyway, because you need to apply waxes in a particular sequence. You, you want to apply warmer waxes over top of colder waxes, but not the other way. If you do it the other way, the cold wax will peel off because it can't adhere to the warm wax as well. So for instance, if it warms up through the day, you can just keep putting more wax on your ski as you need to change the temperature range of your wax. If it gets colder during the day, you may have to scrape the old wax off before you put the new wax on. Um, it's easiest to apply the waxes when the ski and the wax are warm. So I quite often do this at home or in a uh, ski shelter at the beginning of the trail. And then it's easiest to remove the wax when your ski is cold. So I tend to do that outside uh, before I head home. So waxing is, uh, is not a big complicated task. I spend a minute on it every time I go uh, skiing and uh, uh, it makes life great and enjoyable on skis. I make a point when I'm going out skiing to uh, always take the wax of the day with me. So if it's, for instance, minus eight, I'm gonna take a wax that covers that range. And then I'm gonna take the next warmer wax and maybe a next two warmer waxes with me, especially in the springtime when the temperatures can get, get higher up. Cause there's nothing worse than getting out onto a trail, temperature goes up, it's a great day. And suddenly you don't have any grip because your wax doesn't work at that temperature. If you don't have the right wax, then you're going to be slip sliding away and having to double pull all the way back home. Much better to have the waxes with you so you can apply the wax you need to get home and enjoy your full skiing day. So now we've got, uh, we've got our clothing for going skiing. We've got the equipment. We've figured out how to do our waxing and how to apply the wax. Now, what about you as a skier? What do you need to do to prepare for the skiing season? One of the great little ways to make sure you're prepared is to, uh, to know about this cross-country skiing responsibility code. And this little code is a good way to make sure that you can enjoy the, uh, uh, your skiing experience and help others enjoy the skiing experience as well. First item in this, always check the posted trail conditions. Find out, you know, decide where you wanna go, find out what the trail conditions are like there. ManitobaParks.com and CCSAM.ca, Cross Country Ski Association of Manitoba, are the two best websites in Manitoba for getting cross country ski trail conditions. And along with this, 
you want to make sure that you've got a map of those trails as well and know where you are when you're out skiing on these trails. Just in case something happens, um, you know, you need to be able to relay your location or, uh, or get somebody to come out and help you. And today's little trivia point. Did you know that all trail maps for provincial parks have this grid on them, which is kind of a search and rescue grid? So if you had uh, a mishap over here on this trail system, you might be able to call out for help and say, uh, boy, I'm, I'm at H9. And that's where they can come and come and find you. Or if you're encountering somebody out there who's having difficulty and have to, uh, to get some help into them, you can re refer to that, uh, that sequence on the map to help get assistance to folks. Uh, moving on with our code of responsibility. Um, many trail systems have uh, one-way trails. And it's always best to uh, to ski in those those directions that are indicated by the trail signage. Uh, this is going to probably make things best in terms of negotiating hills, safely going up and down hills. And um, you know, if there happen to be trails that are closed, then respect both signs and stay off those trails. Always ski to the right when you're meeting skiers, and if uh, or if you have skiers who are passing you, and if you're have somebody passing you, know, they should be calling out track or hello or something to let you know they want to go by and then you just step off to the right and let them go by. Uh, make sure you always ski in control. If uh, you're skiing in an area where trails are two-way, remember that skiers going downhill have the right of way over skiers going uphill. And if you have to stop along the trail, make sure you step off to the side of the trail uh, so pe other people can go by. And if you have to, uh, for instance, walk up or down a hill just to be on the uh, on the safe side, or if you're uh, taking your skis off, be sure to step off the track so that you don't damage the tracks uh, and make it more difficult for other people to ski. Uh, we're all out there to get some exercise and enjoy the outdoors. So you know, do, don't litter, track out what you what you carry in, and respect all property and that sort of thing. And then. Skiing, skiing community is a big happy family, so let's uh, let's all work together and report any incidents that happen and help people that might have any uh, any difficulties along the trail. They'll uh, certainly help you in in return if if needed. And then most importantly, have fun when you're out skiing. What the, what the whole thing is about. Now the other way to prepare for the ski season is to take a ski lesson. And uh, I'm sure many of you are, will have or uh, will be signing up for the clinics that are coming up in provincial parks. Uh, and this is a, a great way to, uh, to make your skiing more enjoyable. If you can ski more efficiently, you'll be able to get along on these trails with the greater ease and enjoy the scenery and the, and, the, and the fresh air. The ski clinics that are gonna be offered in provincial parks this winter, uh, we'll cover off these classic skiing techniques, the diagonal stride, which is our technique for flat ground and going up gentle hills, double pulling, which we use for flat ground when there's lots of glide and uh, going down hills. And then we'll probably get into some time where we can work on the snowplow technique for controlling our descent down steeper hills. Uh, the instructors in these clinics are going to be giving you some key points on each of these techniques, some exercises that uh, you can work through to help improve your technique, and some individual feedback so you can take home a couple of ideas on how to improve your own skiing. It's going to be enough to uh, get you started if you're just getting into skiing, and if you've been skiing for, for many years, this is a chance to sort of polish up your technique and, uh, you know, get a little bit more power, a little bit more glide out of your stride. Now, the clinics are going to be about an hour and a half to two hours long, and they're guaranteed, guaranteed to be a lot of fun. Now, I'm preparing for these, these clinics, or for a ski lesson, if you're taking a ski lesson someplace else, uh, think about... Uh, particular parts of your skiing experience uh, how, of how you ski that you want some help with. 
or maybe think about a particular area on a trail where you always have a challenge. You know, it's that that turn at the bottom of the hill where I always have difficulty. I go flying off the trail. I don't know how to get around it. And bring these these thoughts and these questions to your ski instructor, and the instructors will be able to sort of tailor the lesson for you so that you can. Uh, learn what you need to learn to be able to you know, go turn on the hill or improve your glide or get rid of that slapping noise that annoys you as you're uh, doing your diagonal stride. The instructors love to get lots of questions to uh, help them structure their, their lesson for you. And uh, with that, this ski instructor would love to get some questions from you this evening. So we've covered off some of the preparatory stuff for skiing, clothing, equipment, waxing, and getting ready for, for your lessons and your clinics. And we can take a few minutes now, I think, Sloan, to uh, get into some questions. I'm just going right. to stop the share here. Uh, yeah, we've got a few questions here. Uh, lots about waxing. Okay, so Sharon asks, uh, I have wood skis. They have been pine tarred. How does waxing work with these skis? Oh, this is a great question. I, I have two pairs of wooden skis and every winter I look at them and think, oh, I'd love to get out on my wooden skis. They ski so nicely. Uh, the pine tar on skis is just a base preparation for the wood. And to, uh, to prepare them for skiing, uh, all you need to do is take um, uh, generally a polar wax, the very hardest uh, grip wax. So if you call that a series of waxes that I, uh, I illustrated, the polar wax is the one in the white tube. And crayon that onto the entire bottom of the ski, polish it to a nice smooth finish, and then apply your grip waxes over top of that right into the, um, uh, the wax pocket underfoot. So your, uh, your polar wax then becomes the glide wax on a wooden ski. Works great, lasts, lasts a really long time. I recall uh, when I was using wooden skis much more often, um, polar wax would last you know, days and days and days of skiing, no, no problem. And then you, uh, as it wears out, it will wear out just on the very tip and very tail of the ski, and you can just apply more and polish it in there, and it's it'll be good to go. Uh, the uh, pine tarring them is a uh, pine tarring the skis if they've uh, kind of lost their dark finish and are uh, you know, basically a wood finish is uh, is a bit of a messy job, and you probably have a difficult time finding pine tar these days, but it's. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it is great skiing on wooden skis. Glad to hear you've got some wooden skis yet. Uh, so Amanda asks, uh, or wants clarification here on skin skis. Are they different from waxless skis or are they waxless skis with skins on them? Uh, yeah, good, good clarification, Amanda. Uh, in, the, in the skiing industry, uh, waxless skis are referred to as those that have the little grooves in the bottom, and skin skis are those that have um, have the mohair strip underneath. Um, the skin skis are technically a waxless ski because the the wax and waxless refers to the grip wax that is applied. All of those skis, whether they're skin skis, waxless skis, or waxable skis, still require a glide wax applied to the tip and the tail. So uh, it, it is a little bit of a, um, uh, perhaps a semantics thing, but uh, yeah, they're they're both waxless skis, but one has skins and one, one has little grooves on the bottom. Uh, Tonya asks, uh, she has skin skis, so she doesn't need a variety of waxes, just need to have the glide zones wax once a year or is there just one type of glide wax to use? Uh, yeah, with again, with most skiers, uh, you, you really only need to get your, your skis glide waxed once a year. And uh, there are a whole range of glide waxes if you want to get really, really technical about it. But if you uh, just take your, your skis into a ski shop 
uh, and tell them you want some glide wax, they'll, they'll apply the glide wax that's appropriate for Manitoba. Glide wax has a considerably larger um, temperature range in which they'll, uh, they'll be uh, useful. So uh, I, I wouldn't worry about the, the technical aspects of, of the glide wax unless you're doing it yourself. And, Go into a ski shop, and they'll just uh, they'll just give you the appropriate wax. <laughs> uh, Allison asked, "Do new skis generally come with glide wax already on them?" If you're buying a ski uh, ski outfit from a shop, uh, yes, the shop should uh, get the skis all waxed and ready to go for you. Uh, if um, I'm not sure about buying skis online. I suspect if you were buying them online, that would not be the case, and then you'd have to uh, you'd have to get them waxed up uh, once you receive them. Uh, and I would I would suggest that um, buying skis online could be very tricky because uh, because of the necessity to have them really quite tailored for your uh, your weight. So. Uh, David asks, is it bad to ski with waxable ski with no wax? What would happen? Uh, waxable skis that don't have wax on them uh, will probably not allow you to uh, get very much grip. So I think you're going to be slipping and sliding all over the place. Um, unless you're skiing in super cold weather, because uh, then uh, you you really don't don't need much for wax in very very cold weather, but uh, a waxable ski uh, does need the appropriate wax for the temperature to make it work properly. So, um, yeah, I, I think basically it's just really not going to work for you if you uh, if you don't have the appropriate grip wax on it. Uh, just a couple more here. Uh, Andy asks, I use some rub on wax crayon with my fish scale skis every time I ski. I also get a hot wax at the beginning of the season. Is there a better waxing method? Uh, now this is with a waxless ski. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with, with a waxless ski, all, all you need to do is get the, uh, get the, uh, the glide wax applied, the hot wax applied, uh, at the beginning of the season, you should be good to go. You, you don't want to apply grip wax of any type over top the uh, um, the grooves, the fish scale pattern on the ski. Uh, that area is, it needs to remain wax free so that it doesn't collect dirt and get uh, get sort of bunged up and lose its uh, effective effectiveness in giving you some grip. Uh, David asks, what is the cross-country ski season from what month to what month? Well, that's that's kind of an interesting one. You know, for, for the really keen cross-country skier or any really keen skier, uh, the season might be year-round. Year <laughs> because I, I know of people that will head down to the southern hemisphere in the summertime to, uh, to go skiing. Um, here in Manitoba, our ski season can vary an awful lot. Uh, sort of depends a little bit on how, how keen you are to get out at the beginning and how determined you are to get a last ski in at the season. Um, I know I've, I've been out uh, you know, as early as mid-November, and I think that was kind of the case this year. People were out in mid-November. And I've been out as late as uh, about the end of April. Uh, other years, you know, if we don't have much snow, it's a much shorter season. I, I recall one spot that uh, had a season that lasted about three weeks one year, and that was it. So usually we can count on, um, you know, three, three months of, of really good skiing in Manitoba. And if you've got the, uh, uh, you know, the kind of the right waxes, if you're using uh, waxable skis or the determination to get out, 
Uh, you can get out in the springtime when most people think all the snow is melted and just have a fabulous ski on some trails in really warm conditions. And uh, uh, the glide can be just just absolutely incredible at times. And people often think the season's over, but some of the best skiing of the season is right at the very end. Uh, David asks, in cold weather, do you use two pairs of socks? Personally, I use two pairs of socks all the time. Uh, I wear a, a thin pair just to act as kind of a... Uh, uh, a buffer against abrasion and then a little bit thicker woolen pair to uh, to serve as an insulating pair. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, it's a matter of, of personal choice. If you like to have just one pair of socks, if, you're, uh, if your boots have a bit of a lining in them, uh, one pair of socks is probably going to uh, be suffi sufficiently warm for you. Um, so there's, there's no no real uh, rule on it. It's just a matter of personal preference. And of course, making sure that uh, uh, that it's going that your boot will fit uh, fit comfortably, whether you're wearing one pair or two pairs of socks. Uh, Caitlin says this is her first year skiing. Uh, what places would you recommend going skiing that are good for beginners in the Winnipeg area? Well, well, welcome to the world of skiing, Caitlin. Um, some of the best areas for skiing for beginners, I would say, would be uh, places like Birds Hill, where the trails are largely flat. Uh, Beaudry is also a, a good spot for beginners. Again, trails are uh, largely flat there. A few little bumps and uh, um, things, but uh, otherwise quite easy to negotiate. Uh, Windsor Park, the uh, Nordic Center here in Winnipeg, uh, has some um, has some very good trails that are uh, suitable for beginners, as do some of the other uh, the other golf courses in in the city. Um, there's actually uh, you know a whole variety of trails across the province though that are suitable for beginners. Uh, so, for instance, there are trails at St. Mallow Park down. Uh, uh, southwest of Steinbach, that uh, again would be really good for beginners. It's very flat terrain there, and um, uh, you know a lot, a lot of other places have have trails that are good for beginners. Um, I think if you uh, if you go on to uh, uh, some of the, the websites, you'll get a, a bit of an indication of what uh, what some of these trails are like, and be able to select ones that are really good for your first time out. Uh, Natalie has a follow-up question about socks. Uh, are wool socks better than cotton? Uh, yes, I would definitely suggest wool socks. I would definitely stay away from cotton socks. You want to stay away from cotton as much as possible because if they get wet, they won't dry and uh, you're going to, to end up getting chilled. If you haven't used um, uh, synthetic clothing, um, like a polypropylene uh, fleece or, or even a merino wool, they're, they're quite amazing because uh, they will dry while you're wearing them. I, I've been out myself uh, skiing hard sometimes. Uh, I know that my, my base layer has gotten wet. Um, I can feel it and you know, I, I keep skiing and maybe, maybe tone things down a little bit so I'm not, uh, not sweating as much. And uh, in fairly short order, that base layer is dried up again. So stay away from cotton and use, use wool or use, use a synthetic. Uh, Tanya asks, is it better to have my skins professionally replaced or could I easily do it myself? And how do I know when they need to be replaced? Uh, replacing skins is probably a job that is best left to a ski shop. The, uh, the skin is glued into a very shallow pocket on the ski, and the, uh, the skins are specific to the brand of ski as well because they're different shapes and the like. So uh, it's not a particularly expensive um, um, 
bit of maintenance on your ski. I don't know what the price would be right now, but uh, you know it's probably in the uh, the sixty or eighty dollar range. And uh, uh, you'll know that this the skins are wearing out. Uh, they'll they'll be a little bit more polished, uh, and they just won't have that uh, that mohair type of, of feel to them. If you run your hand uh, backwards from from tail to tip of the ski and uh, and it you know slides quite nicely on the skin it might be might be time to uh, think about changing the skin or if you're or if you find that you're slipping a lot when you're out skiing that would be uh, another good indicator uh do you know of any places that rent equipment other than windsor park no <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, because I hang around Windsor Park all the time. That's the only one I really quite know of that rents, rents equipment. Um, uh, I don't know if the ski shops do that. Uh, certainly before the pandemic, they did. I think they may not do it as much now because they've probably kind of run out of supply or run out of stock. Mm -hmm. um, Mountain equipment might. I know they did in the past, but I, I don't know if they do now. Yeah, I know there's a place at the Forks that rents skis. Okay. Um, St. Mallow uh, Cross Country Ski Club uh, at the park there. They have skis available for rent. Uh, you can reach out to them through the Facebook page. Uh, Turtle Mountain Nordic Ski Club has, has some skis for rent as well. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. So many of the ski clubs uh, do have their own uh, their own fleets of rental. Birch does as well, uh, and there's also um, uh, Trails Winnipeg has a ski library that uh, sort of goes around the city to different parks, and they uh, they loan out skis so people can can try them. Uh, I think with with all of those places, the skis are to be used at that location. We can't take them to different locations, which uh, you know is a little bit of a drawback if that's what you're looking for. Um, if someone can't make it to one of the ski clinics here in Parks, uh, where would be a good place to take a lesson to improve their glide and eliminate the slapping sound I frequently have when I ski? <laughs> Well, if you've got the slapping sound happening, then a ski lesson is, uh, is certainly something to uh, uh, to get onto your agenda. The best place to get ski lessons uh, is Windsor Park Nordic Center. It's the uh, it's the skiing center in in Winnipeg, and you can uh, you can sign up for group lessons there, or you can take uh, private or semi private lessons. Uh, and instructors are available for lessons. Uh, uh, pretty much any time of any day. Group lessons are offered uh, one or two afternoons, uh, weekday after or weekend afternoons and mornings and weekday evenings. So there's there's lots of opportunities for lessons and uh, uh, certainly you know endless opportunities for for private lessons there. And you can you can uh, book lessons online or just phone uh, phone Windsor Park to book a lesson. Uh, Janelle asked, what age do they start lessons at? Uh, she's looking for her six-year-old. Uh, great question, Janelle. I'm glad you, you raised this. The, uh, the best uh, way to start kids into skiing is through the Jackrabbit program. Uh, this is a uh, actually a Canadian-developed program for kids. Um, and I think it is, uh, I think the Jackrabbit program itself is for kids that are probably about uh, six or eight to about 13, but many clubs have bunny rabbit programs where they're starting kids maybe as early as four years old. And, uh, and kids uh, learn how to ski uh, through lots of fun and games. Uh, they encourage parents to come out with the kids to uh, uh, participate, enjoy, help out. And, um, and there's a progression of uh, of learning for the kids with with trained coaches in those programs, so the kids learn different techniques and improve their techniques over the years, and they've got all kinds of games and events and and the like. The jackrabbit programs um, 
the uh, many of the clubs have them. If you go onto the Cross Country Ski Association of Manitoba website and look at uh, clubs, uh, you'll get a listing there of the clubs and the, and which ones have jackrabbit programs. Uh, there's there's a, a whole pile here in in Winnipeg, and many of the clubs outside of Winnipeg have these programs as well. They're uh, ex excellent program for getting kids to to ski. I think we're caught up on the questions here. Yeah. And any final thoughts here, Ken, before I wrap it up? We've we, we've got a great winter here for skiing. The the weather is just absolutely choice right now with single digits hot single digit highs every day. I mean it's I mean you couldn't ask for better weather. And we've got uh, pretty decent snow cover, I think, in basically all areas of Manitoba yeah. right now. So, uh, so all the trails are in really good condition. So I really encourage people to get out and enjoy the trails, and um, you know, try to uh, uh, try to get into some of these clinics in the parks. Or if you, uh, you know, need a, a bit of a touch up on technique. Um, you know, don't hesitate to take a ski lesson. It's always, uh, always very valuable to improve your technique. Um, I've been, uh, I've been skiing for, uh, I think it's like forty-five years plus or something, and uh, I still take lessons from time to time. Oh. <laughs> it's always good to do, especially if you got that nasty ski slap happening when you're, when you're out, out on the trails. It's an easy fix. Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Ken, so much for the great information this evening. Yeah, trails are definitely in excellent condition uh, across the province. I think it's one of the best winters so far we've had in years. Really good snow coverage right across Manitoba. So, um, yeah, I hope everybody can get out and hit the trails here this winter. And uh, hopefully you can join us for one of our in-person clinics over the coming weeks here. Uh, the one at Birds Hill for this Saturday has filled up. Uh, but you can join our wait list in case uh, space does open up. And there is still space at our White Shell Clinic on January 28th and uh, at Spruce Woods on February 11th. I posted links uh, to register in the chat uh, so you can go there and I'll share them with everyone in a follow-up email tomorrow as well. Uh, if you can't join us for a ski clinic, uh, like Ken says, you can check out the Windsor Park Nordic Center for lessons uh, or look up one of the many ski clubs around the province. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, activities and lessons that, that they host uh, in different areas of Manitoba. So uh, make sure you connect with the ski community there. And uh, we hope that you can join us for other interpretive events this winter in parks. Uh, park interpreters are hosting a wide variety of family fun programs, including guided snowshoeing, skiing, uh, Quincy building, and more. Uh, details for our upcoming events are on our website, manitobaparks.com or you can follow our Manitoba Parks Facebook page for updates. And I uh, just want to say thanks again, to everyone, for joining us this evening. And uh, thanks again, Ken. Uh, always a pleasure having you uh, join us for these ski clinics and, and webinars every winter. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll see everybody on the trails and enjoy the winter season in Manitoba Parks. Happy skiing. Good night.